Hi, I'm Musar, and today we're going to talk a little bit about wave shaping. Now, this is a video that's been requested of me a few times, uh, so I figured I'd actually spend some uh, moments sitting down and actually explaining the concept and, and how I think about it, and hopefully uh, demystify the process of wave shaping and distortion and saturation, all these stupid things in uh, like buzzwords, <laughs> and uh, really look at what's going on. So. The way that I think about wave shaping is that you are performing a control of, or you are taking control, I should say, of the dynamics of a sound at the waveform level. In much the same way, a compressor and a limiter controls the dynamics of a sound on a much larger time scale. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn this compressor into a limiter and then we're gonna turn that limiter into a soft clipper, or maybe a little bit hard or of a, of a soft clip, but in essence, that's what we're going to be doing. Um, so I just have an instance of operator here, which has a low sine wave, nice and easy, nice and simple. Um, you can see over here on the uh, compressor, we have a, a readout of the actual waveforms kind of uh, amplitude curve. And all we're gonna do is pull this down until it hits right at about the top of that um, sine wave. See, we're just barely hitting it. Nothing's happening to the sound at all. Um, <clears throat> now, to turn this from a compressor into a limiter, there's a few things we need to do. First, we need to actually allow the compressor to catch on to the signal. So I'm gonna turn down the attack a little bit. I'm gonna turn up the release a little bit just so it's a little bit smoother. There you go, I'm keeping my eye on this thing right here. And then, as long as the ratio of compression, the dynamics control is over 10, that's when you start to get into limiting. Um, if you're unfamiliar with how compressors work, I recommend you go check out some of my other videos on mixing and uh, the Making Music 101 series, I think goes into that. And eventually I'm gonna do a whole mixing 101 series where we talk about you know, EQs, compressors, and pan pots, and all that fun stuff. Um, but as a quick way of thinking about uh, compression, if I switch over to this middle grid, this XY plane we see right here, is a direct representation of the input volume versus the output volume. As you go up on this, that would be the output volume. And then as you go to the right on this, that's the input volume. This straight line is essentially just saying there's a one-to-one -one relationship. There's a linear relationship between say minus 50 decibels, minus 40 decibels, minus 30, minus 20, minus 10, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, where this yellow dot is at is where the threshold starts to affect the sound. And the ratio is essentially just a mathematical indication of how many decibels of volume over the threshold you need to go to have an output of one decibel. So at this ratio of seven to one, the signal going into this would have to go up seven decibels past the threshold point to get an output of one decibel past the threshold point. This being at, let's just set it to a static minus 14. So what this is saying is that uh, if I had a signal that was going out at minus seven decibels into this compressor, um, 7 dB over the 14 we have it at, we would get 13 decibels out, just a single decibel. So once you get to 10 to one or higher, really you're seeing essentially what we would consider limiting. You are completely um, bricking off that information so that it takes a lot of work to get to a more significant level. For this to clip, uh, we would need to go, I believe, 20 or th almost 25 decibels above this threshold to start hitting zero. Um, and modern compressors can go even further to 101 or 
essentially infinity to one, which is an actual brick wall limiter. There is no amount of volume that can go over zero for this signal to output one decibel over zero. It's always gonna be capped at whatever the threshold is. Now, as I pull this down, you can see the waveform kind of flattens out. I could turn up the makeup gain to rebalance that. You can see nothing's really happening to the signal, but it's definitely getting closer to being loud, right? So we're controlling the dynamics. We have limited the waveform. Now, I'm gonna pull the attack all the way down to 0.1 milliseconds and the release to one millisecond. So I've removed the time constraints. We are essentially operating as close to the sample level as we can get within this compressor. Now watch what happens as I move this threshold down. Let me turn the makeup gain back on. This oscilloscope obviously just showing us the waveform. So as we go past this threshold, any part of the signal that goes over zero is just getting flattened out. And you can even see that on the uh, oscilloscope. The line has this curve that comes down near the zero crossing, this flat line right here. And then all of a sudden, these top and bottom portions just level out. And it starts to sound kind of like a square wave. This is wave shaping. We have done it. You can stop the video now if you really want to. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail as to how you can use certain distortion units uh, with more control. But this is the essence of wave shaping. You're taking the same sort of dynamics control of say taking this transient on a snare drum and then squashing it down so that the overall snare drum can get brought up to be a little bit thicker, a little bit more rounded or a little bit more squared off depending upon how you're doing it. Um, and you're just making it faster and faster and faster and faster and faster until it really is only um, affecting those individual cycles of the waveform's oscillation. Now here I have Isotope Trash, a pretty decent uh, wave shaping distortion plugin. Um, and we're just going to start playing with this because there's one important distinction between a compressor and a wave shaper. Now, as I increase this, the tension on this wave shaper, you can see we're starting to add gain and volume to the signal and pass the point. You can see we're even starting to round off that waveform. If I reset this curve, looking from this dot right here to this dot right here is exactly the same sort of shape as this on the compressor. This right here is essentially the same exact thing as the top half of this XY grid. As I turn this up, it's similar to increasing the ratio and bringing down the threshold like that. So that's the point where it starts to round off. You can look at this middle line right here as this middle line, the flat response of no signal when the input is neither positive nor negative in the cycle of the waveform. As you increase this, it says, well, as you're moving up towards, say, plus 0.25, plus 0.5, plus 0.75, and plus 1, take the waveform and move it as if it was, well, here it's going to be at, like, 0.3. This will be at 0.4. This will be at 0.8. This will be at one at the maximum, but we're kind of reaching up to be a little bit faster. And right now, this reflects back down onto the negative side, uh, which would be the bottom half of this waveform. So typically when you're dealing with a wave shaper, you're going to be kind of focusing in on like what the top half of the waveform quote unquote is doing, but it also affects the bottom half. So let's, uh, let's play around with this a little bit just to kind of see what different wave shaping um, curves will do to a signal.
make this linear now. See, it's getting a little bit softer, but if I add in a node, start flattening this out, you can really see at this point, the majority of the waveform is supposed to be spending its time up at the maximum or minimum in terms of negative amplitudes. Obviously, it's not going to be a perfect representation because we're taking a sine wave and we're kind of flattening it out. So the sine wave will have kind of its own oscillation to work with. But we get some pretty gritty and angry sounds out of that, right? And different curves, if I go ahead and remove this, set this back to attention. If I change this to, say, a square wave, you can kind of see. Ooh, sorry about that. You can see almost each of these little square bumps showing up in the waveform of the sound. Uh, and different slopes will have different shapes. Obviously, like sine waves are going to be very kind of FM-y because you're almost injecting a sine wave through this dynamic control process. Sounds kind of like FM. Um, this is sine folding distortion. Uh, these first two are not folding distortion or fold back distortion. These, as you can see, it doesn't just slope up. It actually folds back, and that's where kind of the folding part of the distortion algorithms come in. Um, and the only other important thing to think about um, is what happens if you change the top and the bottom halves, the positive and negative slopes, differently. I've just activated bipolar mode, so now I can have two different slopes. And you can now see how this only affects the stuff that would be going below this line. This is only affecting stuff that would go above. So we can really thin out, almost kill the wave, start to play with things. This will start to really adjust where we count those zero crossings. You can even start to build your own fold back kind of distortion. And this will take um, a little bit of time to wrap your head around. I recommend you start the way I did. Try and turn a compressor into a limiter, and then try and turn that limiter into a distortion unit. And think about what happens when you adjust the threshold, what happens when you adjust the knee, which is how quickly that distortion, big air quotes there, will be applied, and what could happen if you were able to apply this only to one half of the waveform and a different one to only the bottom half of the waveform. Then look at some various wave shapers. There's some good free ones out there. Um, I think most stock uh, plug-in effects in most major DAWs have some form of wave shaping um, built in, like Ableton Saturator comes with a built-in wave shaper. You can set this up here. You can see all of the slopes and stuff. It's obviously not going to be a perfect thing, but you can still get some pretty cool sounds out of it, right? Um, so that is honestly all there is to wave shaping. And I say that um, kind of tongue in cheek because clearly there's so much more to talk about. Things like odd ordered harmonics versus even ordered harmonics, uh, the kind of difference between tube and tape distortion and stuff like that. There's a whole lot of math and physics that go into it that's really, really cool. But in terms of like the essential things that you need to know to go from not having any background or not having any complete understanding of how wave shaping works to where you're at hopefully at the end of this video, uh, this should suffice. Uh, if you have any other comments or any other suggestions, uh, feel free to drop them in the comments below. I'd love to hear your favorite distortion or wave shaping plugins. Um, 
If you like this content, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the little bell thing. Uh, maybe check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash makes. Same as my Twitch, twitch.com, or twitch.tv, excuse me, makes. Um, check out my Twitter, maybe. I post a lot of fun stuff on there. Um, I've been starting to roll out more things on my Patreon, um, like early videos and stuff like that. I want to start doing uh, more content for Patreon as well. So if you have any suggestions, comment box below. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and uh, have a good day. Bye.